Well, good evening and welcome to our online worship service here at Amy and Park Chapel. Uh, we continue to be saddened by the fact that we can't physically gather together, uh, but we're also thankful that we have these means where uh, we can continue to read God's word, we can think on it uh, as we hear it preached, we can uh, unite together in prayer and in song. And while we recognise this is a poor substitute for the physical gathering of the body of Christ, uh, we rejoice that God's spirit is not restricted or, or crippled by uh, these uh, social distancing measures. We are thankful that the word of God is not bound. And so as we come, we can come with expectancy. We can come in hope that God will continue to work. So as we begin, let me read some words from Isaiah, Isaiah 11, where we read, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Let's pray together. O Lord our God, as we as we come to you now, as we seek your face, as we come into your presence, we thank you and praise you and worship you that you are righteous, that you are just, that you judge with equity and fairness. Lord, we come and we, we confess our sin to you because, Lord, we know that in your righteous judgment, we should be condemned. Lord, we confess that we are wicked and that we deserve to face your wrath. But Lord, we, we thank you that you have raised up that shoot from the stump of Jesse, that you have raised up your son from that tree that was cut down, and that in your son, we find the forgiveness of our sins. We find a, a cleansing from all unrighteousness that even though we deserve condemnation, we thank you that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And so Lord, we pray that as we come to you uh, this evening, that we would know your spirit at work in our hearts. Lord, help us to see your son more clearly. We pray that your spirit would open our eyes, that we may behold his glory. Lord, we pray that by your spirit, you would transform our hearts, that we would be made holy and righteous, that we would be equipped to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. So come, Lord, meet with us in this time, we pray, because we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing of the faithfulness of our God as we begin. And number 106 in our hymn books, it is, Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not as thou hast been. Thou forever wilt be. Let's sing together. Great is thy faithfulness.
Well, we're going to turn in our Bibles now to our reading. And tonight we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter, uh, sorry, Luke 3, Luke chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 1 to 22. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 22. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusations and be content with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod, the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, And when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Well, we're going to come to our God now in prayer. Let's pray together. O Lord our God, as we come to you, we 
we praise you because you are the holy, holy, holy God. We praise you, Lord, because you are light and in you there is no darkness. Lord, with you there is no shadow of turning. There is no sense in which you are worthy of our praise one day and then the next you have changed. Lord, we thank you that you are the perfect, righteous, holy, eternally unchanging God. We bow in your presence, Lord, because we recognize that we are unworthy. And Lord, as we look around us in this world, we, we see statues of men once celebrated, once lifted up onto a pedestal, quite literally, and yet now being torn down and thrown away because of the evil that was in their hearts. And Lord, we, we recognise that if we saw people for who they truly were, if we saw the, the wickedness and the sin that went on in every human heart, we, we would have no statues left. Lord, no one in this world is worthy of being lifted up on that pedestal and worshipped as if they were sinless. Lord, we, we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of your glory. No one is righteous. No, not even one. But Lord, we thank you and we praise you that in you, in your Son, we find the only one who is worthy of being lifted up. We find the only one who is worthy of our praise and our adoration. In you, we find the only one who is eternally perfect. Lord, we thank you that there is no hidden evil in you, that you are not loved and adored and cherished by one generation only for the next to find some hidden evil in you. Lord, we, we thank you that you are the unchanging, holy, holy, holy God. Lord, we live in a world that is restless, a world that is so desperately seeking justice. And yet, Lord, in our search for justice, it seems that we just keep doing even more injustice. We, we seek for peace, but in our search for peace, we do more violence. And so, Lord, as we live in this restless, unjust violent world, we cry to you. We lift our hearts to you because, Lord, we know that you are the just judge, that you are the one who rules in righteousness, that you are the only one who can bring peace and that you have brought that peace through the blood of your Son. And so, Lord, as we see that the chaos in the world around us, we lift our eyes to you. From where does our help come from? Except from you, seated, enthroned on Zion's hill. Lord, we lift our voices to you and, and we pray for our world. We pray particularly at the moment for our nation, Lord, as we see uh, the, the lockdown being eased, we pray that you would give particular wisdom and, and boldness to our, our leaders, the leaders of our nation, to make wise decisions, to make bold decisions. 
And Lord, we pray for the rulers of our nation, but Lord, we also pray for the rulers of our, our church. We pray for those that you have put in authority in our fellowship, for our elders and for our deacons. We pray, Lord, that you would give them a particular wisdom to know how and when to restart the, the gathering of the body. Lord, with so many different things to consider, with social distancing, with people's health, uh, with a concern to, to gather as one body, Lord, we, we just pray that you would make the way plain for us. That you would provide a, a wisdom that is not from themselves, but a wisdom that comes from you. Lord, we, we pray for our elders and our deacons, but we pray for ourselves as, as members of this congregation, that you'd give us patience in, in this time of waiting, that you, would, that you would, through this time where we are separated, that you'd create in us a greater longing, a greater desire, a greater passion for, for the gathering of the body. Uh, Lord, a, a greater longing for the day when we can meet together in fellowship here uh, in this chapel. But Lord, even more, to have a greater longing and a greater desire for that great day when we will be gathered in, where we will meet together as one united body with all the saints, where we will be in that great gathering above. So, Lord, as we come to your word tonight, we pray that you would feed our souls. Lord, please meet with us. Sustain us by your word. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Lord, we pray that we would know a real fellowship with you, that you would speak to us, and Lord, for those who do not know you, we pray that you would save them. So Lord, we, we come to you and we commit ourselves into your loving care because we pray all of these things in and through the name of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing once more before we come to God's word, we're going to sing, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me to come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Let's sing together, just as I am.
well, please do come back with me to Luke chapter 3 as we consider these words tonight. Identity. Identity is a buzzword of our time. It's the talking point at at the heart of so many issues that we see in the world around us today. Whether it's racial identity, gender identity, cultural identity, religious identity, political identity. Identity is at the center of so many questions. Like, who decides my identity? Can I change my identity? Are there certain identities that are discriminated against? Are there other identities that are given preferential treatment? And what happens when two identities clash? Identity is a divisive issue. But you know, we're not alone in history when it comes to people being divided over identity. If we were to rewind the clock 2,000 years to the time at which our reading took place, the lines at which people were divided would have been in in different places, but identity would still be at the root of the issue. So rather than political left or right, it would have been pro-Rome or anti-Rome. Rather than the gender pay gap, it would have been the gender rights gap. And perhaps most importantly for our text tonight, Rather than black or white, it would have been Jew or Gentile. The lines are in different places, but identity is still the point of contention. Now, just to recap uh, where we are, we, we looked at these verses last time we were in Luke's Gospel, and Uh, Last time we had our camera set up with a wide angle lens and we were looking at the ministry of John as a whole. Uh, We saw that John had this message of repentance to return to the Lord. We saw that John's goal was that people would come to the forgiveness of their sins, that they'd be washed clean of their guilt. We saw that John's version of morality is all about honesty and justice and charity. And we saw that the response to John's preaching was one of opposition and hatred. So that was the the panorama view. And now we're going to zoom in to just a couple of verses. Uh, And tonight, we're simply just going to work through those verses, and we'll draw out some lessons as we go. The verses that I want us to focus on are verses 7 to 9. So let me read those words again. Luke 3, verses 7 to 9. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So here is John. John is down by the river Jordan. Now, perhaps there's a few people coming out to the river, uh, some of them to, to wash their clothes. Maybe they've come to take a quick bath. And maybe if the weather's been anything like it has been this week, 
Uh, they've come to just cool off. And as they're there, enjoying the nice, warm, Palestinian sun, their attention is caught by a man just downstream. And people are sitting on the bank of the river, listening to this man. He's, he's gathered a crowd. And so, as we get a little bit closer to hear what this man is saying, we, we catch a snippet of, of what he's saying. He says, we have all sinned. We've all turned our backs on God. We've forsaken his laws. We've rejected his commandments. And so now you must repent, return to the Lord, and pray that he would forgive you of your rebellion. And so as this man is speaking, as he's preaching to this crowd, as someone stands up in the crowd and they say, I want to be forgiven. And so together, this man and the preacher, they go down into the river and the preacher dips this man under the water and he baptizes him. Now, as the day rolls on, there's this group of people who come out of the city and come to listen to this preacher. And as this new group arrives, the preacher speaks to them. He addresses them specifically. I wonder what you'd expect, what would you expect him to say? Come on, John, your crowd is growing. There's more people coming to listen to you. Make sure these people feel welcome. Make sure you give these people a warm reception. Make sure this crowd, they want to come back next time. Here's what he actually says. You brood of vipers... Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? John, you can't say that. Can you imagine, just for a second, the church reopens after lockdown. It's our first service back. And so we want to make people feel welcome. We're so thankful that we can meet together again. And and so we've put the friendliest people we can think of on the door. We've got Mike McNeil on one door. We've got Bradley Doyle on the other. We think, yeah, we want to give people a warm reception as they come through the doors. But every time someone arrives, they say, what are you doing here, you snake? (laughs) You can't say that. We would never let those two back on door duty ever again. That is outrageous. This is not how you welcome an audience, John. But John isn't here to give people a nice, warm, friendly welcome. He's not here to to make sure he he gathers a, a nice big crowd. He isn't concerned with the size of his audience. No, he is here to confront people with the reality of their evil, unbelieving heart. And so as as this preacher sees this crowd coming out, he doesn't see a nice group of innocent people just coming to hear what he has to say. No, he sees slimy, slithering, deceitful people with no interest in hearing what he has to say. These people are snakes. They are deceivers. They they put on the show of of outward religion. But their hearts are cold and callous. And they're like snow white apple. Looks juicy and delicious on the outside. But inside is full of poison. These people, they're under the impression that they're, they're fine with God. I'm okay, thank you very much. Uh, they don't need this repentance. They don't need any of this forgiveness of sins. This is, this is beneath them. They are good enough as they are. And so John says to them, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Who told you you need forgiveness? Why have you come to listen to me, says John? If you think you're so righteous, 
then what are you doing here? And they go around telling everyone how squeaky clean they are, how they don't need to be washed. And yet they've come to listen to John talk about how we're all filthy and we all need to be washed. What are you doing here? You don't believe there is a wrath to come for you. So why are you running away from it? Well, let me ask you John's question. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Maybe as you listen to this, you're saying to yourself, well, I don't believe there is a God. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, oh, Jesus, he, he was just a good person. Maybe you say to yourself, wow, I don't, I don't believe in a hell. I think God will just let me into heaven. Well, then why are you here? I'm not going to go so far as to call you a snake. But if you are deceiving yourself into thinking that you're just fine the way that you are, well, then why are you here? Why would you come to listen to someone like me tell you, no, there is a God. Jesus Christ is his son. And if you do not trust in him, then there is a hell that is awaiting you. I'll answer that question for you. I think you're here because there's something gnawing away at the back of your mind. You claim that there is no God, but deep down in your heart, you know that's not true. You claim that you're good enough to just be let into heaven, but deep down you feel guilty. You feel rotten. You, you say that there is no wrath to come. But, but there's something in your heart that is telling you to run. To run and to flee from that wrath that you, you don't believe in. And so just like this group felt drawn to go down to the River Jordan to listen to John... You have been drawn to listen to God's word. So listen. Listen to what God has to say to you. Be because that gnawing at the back of your conscience is right. There is a God. Jesus is his son. And there is a wrath that you need to flee from. But how? how? How do you flee? Well, next, John says to his crowd in verse 8, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. In the garden back home in Wiltshire, where my parents live, they have three trees. In one corner, there is an apple tree. In the middle, there is a plum tree. And in the other corner, there is a cherry blossom tree. And it won't surprise you to learn that on the apple tree, there grows apples. On the plum tree, there grows plums. And on the cherry blossom tree, there grows pink cherry blossom. Well, here in these verses, John describes people like trees. And he says that these trees should bear fruit. There should be growth from these trees. So, so what sort of fruit is it? Well, what sort of thing should we expect to see growing in the lives of these people? He says bear fruits in keeping with, or fruit that matches up with, or fruit that belongs to Repentance. The tree that is your life should be a repentance tree. Repentance should be a fundamental part of your life. Just as the tree in the corner was an apple tree, it, it is fundamental to the nature of the tree that it is apple. The nature of your life must be repentant. You mustn't be a morality tree. 
You mustn't be a religion tree. Instead, you must be a repentance tree. That is how you flee from the wrath to come, by repenting, by turning to the Lord. And the way that you live your life should look like the kind of life that you'd expect to see coming from someone who is repentant. That the fruit in your life should be the sort of fruit you'd expect to see from someone who is repenting. From someone who is a sinner, who acknowledges and confesses their sin, who comes to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and has been forgiven by him. Your lifestyle should match up to repentance. Now, as John calls people to repent, as he invites them to turn to the Lord, he knows what's going on in their heads. You don't have to be a mind reader to figure out what these people are thinking. This is what they're thinking. Look at verse 8. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. As they hear the call to repent, these people are thinking, but we're Jews. We're the chosen people of God. We are, we are the sons of Abraham, the great patriarch. Do you notice what they're doing? They are appealing to their identity. They think that because of their upbringing, because of the family that they were born into, they don't need repentance. They think that their identity makes them better than all these other sinners. They think that by being Jewish, they are superior to everyone else. If you were to ask one of these folk, well, how do you think you're going to get to heaven? They'd say, well, I'm a Jew. If you were to ask them, how do you sleep at night knowing the evil that you have done? They'd say, well, I'm a child of Abraham. Their hope is resting in their identity. Now, if I was to ask you those same questions, I wonder what you'd say. Why do you think you would go to heaven? My parents are Christians. How do you sleep at night with a guilty conscience? Oh, I, was, I was christened as a baby. I, I ticked Christian on that census. Listen to John's response to what these people are thinking. Verse 8. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. The question goes out, how are you going to get to heaven? The response comes back, I'm a child of Abraham. To which John replies, and? So what? whoop de do Do you want a medal? And then he picks up one of the stones from the side of the river. And he says, God could replace you with a rock if he wanted to. Your identity does nothing for you. You are as, at as much of an advantage over other people as a rock. The fact that you are from the family line of Abraham makes no difference whatsoever. You still need to repent, just like everyone else. So for you, if you're sitting listening to this this evening, and you hear this call to repent, and you think, oh, I'm okay, I don't need to repent because my parents are Christians. Uh, I'm okay because I went to Sunday school when I was younger. Uh, I'm okay because... Fill in the blank. Do me a favor, just look around your living room for a second, or wherever you're watching this. Pick an object, any object. It could be the chair that you're sitting on, 
or it could be the, the picture frame on your wall. It could be that ornament on your windowsill, any object. John's point here is to say that God could make a Christian out of that chair that you're sat on just as easily as he can make a Christian out of you. God could make a Christian out of the chair that you are sat on just as easily as he could make a Christian out of you. It's going to take a miracle either way. Your identity, your nationality, your upbringing, your gender, your social status, none of it is of any use to you when it comes to getting into God's kingdom. It's rubbish. Even if you are the most privileged person on the planet, you are as close to getting into heaven as a lump of rock. I hope that humbles you. Because John's point here is that you have nothing whatsoever that you can boast in in yourself. Nothing. Nothing that you have, nothing that you are is of any advantage to you. But I hope that's also an encouragement to some of you. Because at the moment, our world is so caught up with which identity has life easiest, which identity is discriminated against. But do you see, as far as God is concerned, there is no advantage whatsoever to being white or male or rich or privately educated. Nothing is of any advantage to you. Whoever you are and wherever you are from, there is as much hope for you to be saved as there is for a lump of rock. If God can make a child of Abraham from a stone, then he can definitely make a Christian out of you. And so just as the most privileged person on the planet has no advantage over anyone else, so too the most disadvantaged person on the planet is no worse off than anyone else. The ground at the cross is a level playing field. As John is warning these people that their identity does nothing for them, he goes on to say this in verse 9. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, I want you to imagine yourself in an orchard. Let's stick with apples. We talked about apples a lot. Maybe you could go for something more exotic. Maybe you could imagine yourself in an orange grove. Uh, And the farmer is taking you through his orchard. And as you go down the row of trees, you see one after another, after another, after another. Every single tree is weighed down by its crop. Every single tree is producing its fruit. But then you you come to the end of a row. Uh, And at the end of this row of trees, there is one tree. And on this one tree, there is no fruit whatsoever. Not even a blossom or a bud. Nothing. Uh, And so you ask the farmer, what's going on? Why is there no fruit on this tree? And and so he explains, well, it's been like that for years. Uh, He's tried everything. He's pruned it. He's dug around it. He's put some fresh soil. He's used fertilizer. One year, he even dug the whole tree up, roots and all, and he moved it to a different part of the orchard. But nothing has worked. And so, with a glum look on his face, he says, I think I'm just going to have to chop it down. It's only good for firewood now. 
John says to his audience, and he says to us tonight, if you do not bear fruit, you are only good for firewood. So do you remember that the kind of fruit that we're supposed to produce? You are meant to produce repentance fruits. You are meant to be a repentance tree. And so we would hope to see humility at the wickedness of your own heart. Confession of your sin to Jesus Christ. Faith in the saving work of Jesus. Obedience as we have turned to the commands of the Lord. If none of that fruit is showing, if none of that fruit is growing, then there is something wrong with the tree. If you cannot see any of those characteristics in your life, then there is something wrong with your soul. Be warned that the Lord Jesus Christ is wandering through his orchard, even as we speak. And he may have come tonight to examine the fruit that is growing from your life. Tonight, your soul may be required of you. And if there is no fruit that is in keeping with repentance, then the Lord Jesus Christ is going to go to his tool shed. And this time, he's not going to get his pruning hook. He's not going to get his spade. He's not going to get any fertilizer this time. He's gone to collect his axe. And he will lay that axe at the root of your tree. And you'll be cut down. And you'll be thrown into the fires of judgment. But hope is not lost. Your lonely, fruitless tree stuck at the the bottom of that orchard is not condemned to a life of fruitlessness before a judgment of fire. Upon hearing what John has to say, upon hearing that the prospect of this judgment by fire, the, the crowds, they all ask John the same question that you are asking right now. What do we do? How do we escape that judgment? How can we bear fruit so that we're not chopped down? And so John explains to them the kind of fruit that he'd expect to see. The repentant person is no longer selfish, but charitable. The repentant person is no longer a thief, but honest. The repentant person is no longer a cheat, but someone who loves justice. But more than simply teaching these people the kind of fruit that they should see in their lives, John ultimately points them to the gardener. Here is the one who has the pruning hook. Here is the one with the fertilizer. Here is the one who has the axe. He is the one whose shoelace John is not worthy to untie. It's Jesus of Nazareth. Now, as you've been listening to this tonight, I'm worried that you may be under the impression that all you have to do to make sure that you're not cut down is you just have to make sure that there is enough fruit in your life. You just have to work hard enough and be good enough to make sure that Jesus likes what he sees. The reason why that worries me is because you and I both know that that is not possible. You cannot just make yourself grow. You cannot produce fruit just by working hard enough. The child cannot make themselves taller just by 
thinking tall thoughts. That they cannot make themselves older just by dreaming of what they're going to do when they grow up. And so too, the, the tree in the orchard, it, it can't just think hard enough. Fruit. No matter how hard you try to be a good person, to live the sort of life that you think a repentant person should live, it will not happen. And actually, as you try and produce fruit, you see that you produce the wrong kind of fruit. You try and produce fruit of righteousness, but all you ever see is the fruit of sin and wickedness. You want to produce apples, but you only ever produce pears. And do you know why? It's because your identity is all wrong. You're actually the wrong sort of tree. No wonder you keep producing pears. It's because you're a pear tree rather than an apple tree. No wonder you keep producing bad apples. It's because you're a bad apple tree. No wonder you can't stop yourself from sinning. It's because you are a sinner. That is your identity. It is ingrained into your nature. Your nature is sinful. And so as John is preaching here, he knows what sort of fruit they should produce. He knows the sort of life they should live. But he cannot change their nature. He cannot change their identity as sinners. And that is why he has to point us to someone else. He has to point us to the gardener. John tells us in verse 16 that Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So as we come to Jesus, as we trust in him, as we put our faith in him, he doesn't just dust us down, give us a bit of a boost and send us on our way. No, he baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. Jesus fundamentally changes our nature. When we come to Jesus Christ and we put our trust in him, and we ask for forgiveness from him, we are born again. We are recreated from being a sinner, a, a bad tree that produces bad fruit, to being a repentant sinner, saved by the grace of God. And by God's strength, producing good fruit. You don't just need a, a pep talk to get you producing fruit in your life. No, you need a new identity. You need a more radical change. Let me read to you the words of a Christian man who is same-sex attracted. This is what he says. What I most want to avoid is any other identity that might attempt to displace my fundamental identity as a Christian. For the thing that defines me most in my life is not my sexuality, but my status in Christ as a son of God. Here is a man whose identity, as the world see, sees it, seems to be so opposed to the teachings of Christianity. And yet, because he has had a heart transplant, because he has been transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ, he can say that he has a new identity. An identity that is above anything else, and it is found in his status as a child of God. The people down at the riverside that day, they found their identity in their nationality. Everyone at the moment is talking about identity based on the colour 
of their skin. Maybe you define your identity in some other way. But the message that John has for us is is that at the end of the day, there is only one identity that matters. There is only one identity that counts. And that is whether or not you are a child of God, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. However else you define yourself, The only way that you could be a repentance tree, producing good fruit, the only way that you will not be cut down and thrown into the fire is if your identity is found in Jesus. Let's pray to him now. Our Lord Jesus Christ, We thank you that at the cross you were willing to give up your righteousness. That you were willing to pay the price of your life so that we may be redeemed. Lord, we thank you that because you have given up your life, that we can take hold of that life. That even though we are wicked people who produce wicked fruit, that if we come to you, we can have a new status, a new identity, that we can be transformed, that we can be rescued, So, Lord, we pray that above all else, we would rejoice at being your children. Lord, for any who do not yet have that identity, for anyone who is busy identifying themselves in some other way, Lord, we pray that they would see the bad fruit that is produced in their life and that they would run to you and that they would find their hope in you. Because we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close, we're going to sing, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain whatever it was that we thought was the best thing in the world. My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. It's nothing. It's empty. It's worthless. Let's sing together when I survey.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forever. Amen.